I have a blasphemous confession to make. I like Godzilla, but most of the other giant monster movies Toho Studios made during the 50s and 60s are better than most of their Godzilla movies. The original Gojira is Gojira. It's one of the best movies ever made, of any genre. Of course it is. It's a somber, sublime, moody, aching reflection on the horrors of the atomic bomb by the only country to have not only had one, but two atomic bombs dropped on it. But it's also not lost on me that the best Godzilla movies are the original and its modern post-Fukushima remake. The odd subsequent Godzilla films do have some interesting things going on, like King Kong vs. Godzilla's satire on post-war Japanese media, uh, Godzilla vs. Hedera's environmentalist psychedelia, uh, Godzilla against Mechagodzilla's live-action anime style, or the actual anime trilogy's meditations on humankind's relationship with nature. But overall, the Showa Godzilla series specifically involves stripping Godzilla of the thematic heft of the first film, and throwing him into films that have spectacle, but little purpose. I enjoy Invasion of the Astro Monster and Destroy All Monsters as much as the next guy. They are my two favorite Showa Godzilla films after the original, but there's not a lot of meat on those bones. They're about the spectacle of monster fights, mass destruction, and alien invaders. Which is fine, if you want to watch a Godzilla movie and don't want to see massive property damage, well, get out of here. But for more interesting ideas, and even more interesting monsters, one has to farm outside of the Godzilla series proper. Some of those kaiju did eventually get folded into the Godzilla series, but several of my favorite Showa kaiju never did. They remain on the outskirts of Toho Tokusatsu films, rarely given the attention they deserve. In my video on Japanese King Kong, I gave capsule reviews of several films released in the period between the original Gojira and King Kong vs. Godzilla. In the span between 1954 and 1962 came Rodan, The Mysterians, Varan, Battle in Outer Space, Mothra, The Last War, and Gorath. They also released most of the Human Transformation series, presaged by Invisible Man in 1954 and Half Human in 1955, and including The H-Man, Secret of Telegion, and The Human Vapor. But those are worthy of a video all on their own. In my capsule reviews, I pointed out that none of these films are Gojira. None of them aspire to the same poignancy and power of that landmark, groundbreaking film. But to be fair, few films actually do. Most films aren't as good as the original Gojira. But it's not to say that most of these attempts by Toho aren't decent in their own right, or even better than the later Godzilla movies. Okay, maybe not Rodan. Uh, there isn't much to it besides how the film is structured. It begins with a misdirection. The apparent threat of giant insects tormenting miners ends up not being the real threat. The real threat is not one, but two giant pterodactyls that emerge from a volcano to torment Japan. It's a fun dual twist, even if the film is thematically empty. The Mysterians is richer, so far as that goes. It explores another dimension of atomic anxiety, being what atomic war might do to humankind itself. It's one thing for giant symbolic monsters to spawn and destroy our cities, but how might the atom mutate the human body? The Mysterians is also a spin-off point for the Human Transformation series, which more or less follows the same theme of how the atom, and technology in general, might transform humankind. In this film, however, we get an alien race from a decimated planet whose genes have been so altered by the fallout that they can no longer healthily reproduce. So these Mysterians are looking to resettle on a small patch of planet Earth, which would be fine if they didn't also demand a selection of Earth women with which to mate. This is a bridge too far, and Earth fights back, only for the terrifying might of the giant robot Mogira to be unleashed, because you gotta get a kaiju in there somehow. The Mysterians had a near sequel that was rewritten into a conceptual sequel in the form of Battle in Outer Space. Toho had addressed the Cold War already in the form of Godzilla Raids Again, with Godzilla and Angiris representing the Cold War atomic powers of the United States and Russian and Chinese communism, with Japan and the rest of the world caught in the middle. 
In Battle in Outer Space, we begin with a tense situation. Terrorist acts and alien spies heralding an invasion from the planet Natal. This certainly isn't the first Cold War sci-fi movie where aliens represent the communists, just like Gojira wasn't the first giant atomic monster movie. But it is fascinating to see Japan's take on that kind of material. Once the Natal threat is exposed, humankind takes to the stars and brings the fight to them. In these sequences, we get a lot of really cool Japanese retrofuturism. There are a lot of great space station, spaceship, and lunar rover designs throughout the film. Uh, Japanese retrofuturism is a whole interesting, colorful, artistic genre of its own, given the divergence of Japanese aesthetic sensibilities from those in the West. Battle in Outer Space and the Mysterians also exemplify a trend in Toho films. In Western films, we're accustomed to a story pace in which the hero is nearly defeated, but returns to snatch victory from its jaws. They did it to Godzilla twice in the Monster vs. King of the Monsters, and again to Kong in Godzilla vs. Kong. But Japan does not follow that trend. In Battle in Outer Space and The Mysterians, as in subsequent movies, we spend a good 10 or 20 minutes just watching the good guys systematically destroy the bad guys. I almost feel sorry for the Mysterians, the Natalians, and even Ghidorah in the end of Destroy All Monsters. Between Battle in Outer Space and the Mysterians was Varan. Varan is mostly just Godzilla again, though without the symbolic poignancy. In many ways, Varan feels a bit more like a dry run at Mothra, uh, insofar as we have an underdeveloped religious angle, with the monster as a god worshipped by this rural community, who turns out to be an actual honest-to-gosh prehistoric kaiju. The original draft of what became Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, giant monsters all out attack, would have featured Varan as a guardian spirit of the wind, alongside Baragon and Aguirus. What Varan mostly has to recommend it is its black-and-white cinematography. Gojira, Godzilla Raids Again, Invisible Man, Half-Human, and Varan were all in black and white, and as we all know, black and white just makes everything better. To paraphrase Walter Benjamin, the grey film of dust on things has become their best part. But after Varan, it was full color all the way. I've talked about Mothra in previous videos of mine, so I won't belabor it here. Mothra, the kaiju, is a kami. Not a communist, but a kami, K-A-M-I, a goddess of nature's cycles of life, death, and rebirth. Few Mothra films really explore the meaning of that, or even put any kind of an exclamation point on it. And it's curious to see how the original Mothra film dances around it. Even though Mothra is a nature deity, there is still an implication of atomic origins. Her domain of infant island has been devastated by atomic testing, with a remnant of the islanders kept safe only by Mothra's power. When Mothra's twin fairy emissaries, which are just what they are without going into any explanation, are kidnapped by the avaricious Rosalicians, Mothra hatches and goes on a rampage. First to Japan, where her larval form cocoons herself and metamorphoses into her winged adult form, and then to New Kirk City in Rosalicia. Despite the name of New Kirk City, this fictional country is non-specific. It's meant to symbolize the atomic Cold War powers, and the threat that the atom poses to nature and the cycles of life here on Earth. Rather than a monster born of atomic violence coming back to haunt us, it is nature herself lashing out in the form of a giant moth. The Last War is a tokusatsu film unlike any other on this list, because it's not a sci-fi monster movie. If not for its theme, it might not even belong on the list with Godzilla, Mothra, and Rodan. The Last War is a drama about the lives of various people in Japan against the backdrop of a nuclear war breaking out. If you're an anime fan, you've probably seen several different series by now in which you're following a small group of people around an idyllic setting, only to find out that this is the last place on Earth untouched by an apocalyptic war. The Last War has very much the same tone to it. The tension in it builds as we, the attentive viewer, pick up clues to understand the bigger picture of what is going on, while the characters in the movie do not until it's too late. And like Ojira, the last war gains poignancy by the fact that it is from the only country ever to have suffered nuclear war. Now, Gorath is much like the last war, in that humanity faces an apocalyptic threat. Not a threat of our own creation, but a comet set to collide with the Earth. 
With this outside threat, humanity is forced to band together to literally move the planet a few feet out of the way. However, despite The Last War being Toho's second highest grossing film of 1961, it was only the ninth highest grossing in Japan overall. The cry went out, more giant monsters. 1962 saw King Kong vs. Godzilla, and they made the last-minute addition of the giant walrus monster Maguma to Gorath. Gorath's success was easily eclipsed by King Kong vs. Godzilla, which refocused Toho on making more profitable Godzilla films. They still produced other non-Godzilla films after 1961, but fewer than this feverish period of exploration between 1954 and 1962. 1963's Atragon is perhaps the most interesting of the entire group. It was based on the novel Kaitai Gunken, or The Undersea Warship, a fantastic tale of island adventure, by Shinro Oshikawa. Published in 1899, so between the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95 and the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05, uh, Kaitai Gunken is an unapologetically imperialistic story of Japanese superiority and conquest on the global stage, in which an eccentric genius has invented an invincible submarine that is capable of boring into the earth and flying through the sky. With this machine, the Japanese Empire expands its territories and fends off Western powers within its sphere of interest. In other words, it's a totally inappropriate subject matter for post-World War II Japan. It's fascinating that Toho would have even considered Kaitai Gunken as material for a film. But in their hands, this former ode to growing Japanese imperial might becomes a reflection on the sins of the Empire and the war. The threat of the undersea empire of Mu has risen to threaten the surface world, and the only tool powerful enough to stop it is a secret submarine project initiated in the closing days of World War II. But unlike the Yamato, which was sunk by American bombers before it could be beached on Okinawa, the fictitious Gotengo was kept in secret by a band of fiercely loyal Japanese troops who never surrendered. These last holdouts, like so many that had peppered the newspapers, were prepared to launch the Gotengo flying submarine when the time was right to reclaim Japan's greatness. The tension of the movie comes from the efforts of modern Japanese people to convince the troops to lay aside old imperialistic patriotism and work for the good of the whole world. The next year came Dogura, which is a funny movie that I've mentioned before. It is funny because it has one of my favorite of all the Toho Kaiju, but is also the nadir of their A-plot, B-plot writing. A mystery around a cartel of diamond smugglers is a fair enough way to open the movie. Before too long, the mystery of diamonds that are literally floating away is revealed to be a jellyfish-like creature from outer space floating in the stratosphere. This creature consumes the element carbon, beginning with its most concentrated form in diamonds, and then migrating onto coal. There is a terrifying implication to this progression. As it exhausts each more and more concentrated form of carbon, the space jellyfish Dogura is moving towards less and less concentrated forms, which will inevitably include life. All life on Earth is based on carbon molecules. The monster, in addition to being a welcome divergence from the giant dinosaur style of kaiju, is an apocalyptic threat that will completely sterilize the Earth of life. In the meantime, there's a bunch of jewel thieves! The movie spends so much time focusing on them, and not the apocalyptic threat of Earth sterilization, that it's almost absurd. It's so bizarre that Dogura is actually one of my favorite of uh, Toho's films, in addition to being one of my favorite kaiju. 1965 brought us Frankenstein vs. Baragon. The history of King Kong vs. Godzilla is rooted in the prospectus for a King Kong vs. Frankenstein movie, that special effects pioneer Willis O'Brien developed, but producer John Beck sold to Toho from out uh, beneath him. Toho switched the players around, recasting Godzilla in King Kong's role and King Kong in the Frankenstein monster's role. They did, however, get around to producing a Frankenstein film on their own. In Frankenstein vs. Baragon, the monster's immortal heart was being kept alive and studied by the Nazis, when Allied encroachment required its removal to Japan for safekeeping. Unfortunately, it was being kept safe in a laboratory in Hiroshima. The dose of radiation it received from the atomic bombing caused the heart to begin its own regeneration, eventually becoming a kaiju-sized version of the Frankenstein monster. Baragon is also introduced in this film to give Frankenstein something to fight, 
and propel a case of mistaken identity that gives tension to the story about the most human of kaiju. Frankenstein isn't some totally irrational, alien, or inhuman beast. He's still essentially human, and himself a victim of the atomic bombings. There may even be a subtle commentary in this film over the uses and abuses of Axis science in post-war world. Frankenstein vs. Baragon was followed by the direct sequel War of the Gargantuas, which I'm sad to say is one of the only Toho films I genuinely dislike. I'm not sure what sets me off about it, but this tale of two giants spawned by cells of the Frankenstein monster is just one of the worst. Other people seem to like it, so your mileage may vary, but it is an affront to my own eyes. King Kong Escapes was released in 1967, and I've talked about that more extensively in my video on Japanese King Kong, but it and Latitude Zero in 1969 show Toho becoming more genuinely conscious of the film market outside of Japan. Both films feature American actors and deliberately attempt to court American audiences. Latitude Zero is a thoroughly nutty revisit to Atragon. Toho knew they had something with the iconic drill-tipped submarine, and would reuse the basic idea of it multiple times. In this version, it belongs to a 200-year-old inventor played by Joseph Cotton, in a gloriously flamboyant gold lame suit. Rather than a militaristic Japanese Navy officer, he's a philanthropist who rescues people lost at sea and brings them to his undersea utopia, positioned at a latitude zero, where the equator and international dateline meet. His enemy is the evil Dr. Malik, played by Cesar Romero, who, among other things, likes to create surgical and genetic abominations. Though looking expensive, Latitude Zero is very much a big, campy, wild B-movie. Toho pretty much just, like, straight-up remade Atragon as The War in Space in 1977, reinterpreting the story as a Star Wars-style space opera. And if you've seen any other post-Star Wars attempts to cash in on that film's success, then you have a pretty good idea of the look and feel of the War in Space. And War in Space basically closed out the Showa era for Toho. Terror of Mechagodzilla, the last Godzilla film before the Heisei era, was released in 1975. Before them was Space Amoeba in 1970 and Submersion of Japan in 1973. Space Amoeba is a decent enough kaiju movie with a pretense of a, well amoeba from space that infects life on Earth and turns them into kaiju. It has one of the best kaiju in Toho's canon, Gazora, the kaiju cuttlefish, but it is another of their island romps where they couldn't really be bothered to put in the budget for a model city to destroy. And Submersion of Japan is exactly what it says in the box. It's a disaster movie and a procedural on how evacuating Japan might go if it was consumed by the ocean. Toho's films followed the current trends in science fiction. The 70s were a dour, depressing decade, with dour, depressing, ponderous, pretentious, dull films pioneered by 2001 A Space Odyssey. Despite a handful of minor classics like Alien, Logan's Run, Soylent Green, and The Andromeda Strain, the 70s nearly destroyed science fiction as a genre, and took Godzilla down with it. The giant monster genre was an artifact of the 50s and 60s, when the world was preoccupied by the Cold War going nuclear hot, instead of by guerrilla wars, the draft, the sexual revolution, oil crises, and economic depression. Godzilla, Mothra, Rodan, and the whole lot were set to go the way of giant ants and flying saucers. It was only the release of Star Wars in 1977, an exciting, charismatic film made in direct homage to the movie serials of the 30s and 40s that brought science fiction back from depression and gave us the genuinely lovable films of the 80s and 90s, like Back to the Future, E.T., Terminator 2, Aliens, Jurassic Park, and the Heisei era of Godzilla films. <laughs>